Greetings. This is the 18th message looking at the life and ministry of Hal Harris, the famous Welsh Calvinistic Methodist exhorter. And there's going to be three things that we're going to be looking at, and it's all titled Loving Souls to Heaven. Because that's what Hal Harris was doing, right? He was loving souls to heaven as he was traveling around Wells for, what, good seven or eight years as a preacher, as an organizer of private societies, community groups, if you will, so that souls, once coming to faith in the Lord, could grow in their faith and strength and knowledge. Because they're living in a world where a culture is toxic, it is violent, a, a culture that has a prejudice against God and all those who follow him. Yes, indeed, persecution against the church, against God, against all those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it, it is always there. It's unrelenting. And so he's organizing these community groups. And, and of course, uh, the great preaching of Hal Harrison, how the Lord blessed that to bring countless number of souls to saving faith. And if you remember back in the 1720s, a bishop would say, the Lord's Day had become the devil's market day. There were more deaths and, and, and robberies and unspeakable crimes committed that day than all the days combined. He would go on to say there were all sorts of pro profane works that were created and published, and there was no shortage of publishers who would print them, and uh, there were no uh, shortage of consumers who wanted to purchase them. It's as if sin had lost its shame and Wells was completely dark. I mention this again because that's the culture. That's the toxic, corrosive culture that wants to keep souls in the dark. Yes, indeed. That opposes God, his gospel message, his son, his Holy Spirit, and uh, that oppose the Christian church and all those who confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Um, so that is, that is the, the, uh, the, 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 the evil forces that are against Hal Harris and, and his colleagues. But what is he doing? He's loving souls to heaven. Even his enemies. He knows the Lord calls us to love our enemies. We don't know who, the, we know that the, the Spirit can penetrate the darkness of anyone's heart. We know that somebody could be adamantly against Jesus Christ one moment and the next moment their, their chest of iron has been broken and their hearts are now made soft to receive the gospel message. But he's loving souls all the way to heaven. But it does come at a cost. The personal persecution that Hal Harris suffered, all the lies that were said about him. Because, you know, those who decide to live a godly life will be persecuted. That's what the scriptures tell us in 2 Timothy. And so to justify their persecution, they have to make up things about this man. We're not going to go through them again. But by the time that he's 38 years old, 1752, he's going to feel, and this is a feeling, as if he's dying, that the Lord is bringing him home, and he's at the age of 38 years old. Most people during this time live till they're about 56. And he would tell John Wesley, I have preached until I can no longer preach. And my body is just broken. His strength is gone. You know, preaching like that and traveling and just the inclement weather and sleeping outside and being malnourished at times, it ages one quickly. But Hal Harris is an enthusiast for the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is he doing? Is he giving God glory? Yes, by proclaiming the gospel message? Absolutely. But he's loving souls to heaven, even those who wish to persecute him. In fact, the final story in this week's message will show another example of what I'm speaking about. And this phrase, loving souls to heaven, comes to me yesterday. I, there was an elderly Christian brother who would tell his, the congregation that he belonged to, I will love you all the way to heaven. Let me say it again. An elderly Christian man now, for a number of years or decades, has been telling his church that he belongs to, I will love you all the way to heaven. Now apparently this brother is in need now, because he's elderly, 
Perhaps he himself is going home soon. And the congregation made it publicly how much they appreciate this Christian brother, his love that he has shown them. It has made a public announcement that the congregation says back to him now, we will love you all the way to heaven. You have loved us all the way to heaven. And now in your time of need, we will love you all the way to heaven by meeting your need. And that's called the Christian community. We are knitted together. If there's one thing that you get out of this week's message, it's that Christians belong to a community and that Christians need to be knitted together. Not just on Sundays, but throughout the entire week, throughout our entire lives. And that's a real challenge for us today. And I want us to see this. I want us to extract some truth out of what Hal Harris was doing in Tribeca. So in 1752, as I said, he feels broken. Though he's wrong, the Lord's going to heal him. It's going to refresh him. He's going to live for another 21 years. But he feels as if he's dying. But the Lord impresses on him to stay in Tribeca, to begin preaching, to build a large building. And many are going to come and hear, hear Hal Harris preach, including all the way up from Northern Wells. So they're saying, you're not coming to us, we're coming to you, sir. And what would come out of that is really what would become a Christian monastery, also a Christian theological college, an agricultural center, a Christian community. And it would have over 100 souls. It would become known as um, Hal Harris's family. And yeah, they were very precise and disciplined about their meals, about their daily devotions. There was preaching daily, taking communion of, um, uh, quite often, and completing their daily assignments. And over time, that work would, would expand. So it was not just an agricultural center, but it involved wood spinning and dyeing and weaving and building, uh, road surveying, forestry, shoemaking, tailoring, and even publishing. They would have their own printing press. In fact, I have a book that uh, it's a, a, uh, a sketch of Hal Harris's life that was actually printed on the press um, that they purchased. And this book was printed shortly after his death. So they had a whole variety of tasks, but they were living and working together. And yes, Hal Harris was uh, disciplined, and it was too hard for some people. So there would be those that say, "This is I, I'm glad that I came, but I but I can't live under these conditions." And so they would uh, they would go home. There would be others who say, "No, no, I want to be a part of this family," and they would yes, indeed, sell. You know, forsake all of their worldliness, all their worldly goods, and sell everything, and everything would be to the common good of the Christian community. And this is how they became knitted together. Yes, Hal Harris was accused of stealing people's money, but this is what they overlook. No one contributed more to the family, to this Christian community, than Hal Harris. He wasn't stealing anything from anybody. And then there would be those that would um, that would just visit on a regular basis. I'm, I'm not going to be a member of this family, but, but Triveca, this Christian community, this Christian family that Hal Harris has created is so sweet. It's a respite. Just like what Hal Harris had envisioned in Pilgrim's Progress, what is it? Is it the beautiful palace or the shepherds in the vineyard where, where Christians can receive rest or maybe the interpreter's house? That's what Triveca was. It was, it was a... Um, a multifaceted place, a place for exhorters and preachers. Like I said, it would become a college and all of these different assignments. Then there would be those who say, I'm not officially joining the, the family, but I'm going to move and either purchase or lease a farm nearby so that I can attend the preaching on a regular basis. And out. You know, from Tribeca, by the way, because again, there's no like 50 foot walls that are keeping people in. You know, people are free to come and go. But out of Tribeca, 
They would send young men, men out throughout all of Wells to preach the gospel message. And, and preach they did, and yes, it was difficult. I mean, they, they admitted, they said, oh my goodness, this is really hard. We need Mr. Hal Harris. Because again, there was just so much persecution, so much violence against the gospel message that it was interesting that it was just commented by one of these young men that says, oh, we need Mr. Hal Harris. Yes, indeed. So, um, what was it? What was the community like? Well, there's a um, a lady named Elizabeth, and she was accepted as part of the community in Tribeca. And Hal Harris writes this letter to her, and this is what he says about the community: Our principles are the same as the doctrinal articles of the established church. Our discipline is the same as the uh, apostolic times. The scriptures are our whole soul and only rule of faith and behavior. The free grace of God our Savior and the merits of his precious death is all of our hope. To him alone we fly just as we are and we find him a sufficient Savior. Yes, indeed. Pretty straightforward, pretty biblical, Christ-centered. And this is the point that I would like to make. We may get caught up, and this is how I want to shed a different light on it. We may get caught up on, what is Hal Harris doing? i got to sell all of, my, all of my possessions? I've got to forsake the world, my worldliness, and everything is going to be shared for the common good? Is, is that what we should be doing? Well, maybe. But, um, I mean, what's described in the Bible, what you see in Acts, is not prescribed. In other words, we're not commanded to do such things, but I think it misses the point. And the point is, they were knitted together. Do you see that blessing? They were living and working and worshiping together and loving one another all the way to heaven. So whether you were part of the family or whether you weren't officially part of the family, but you were living nearby, you were knitted together within the same Christian community. And they were doing a variety of things. So the point that I'm trying to make is with the local church evaporating, there's a great cost to that. With all of us traveling, whether it's to work, to school, to church, we all have to travel now, which means we're all more spread apart, which means quite often we may only see each other on Sundays. And at most, maybe twice a week at some community group or a men's study, a women's study, some ministry perhaps, but maybe we're seeing each other twice a week. But we ain't, we're not seeing each other daily. There was a time with the local church where your church might have been three blocks away from you. You could walk to church. And there was a sense of community because you were living and working together within the same town. And so all I'm trying to say is there's value in that. There's value in the fact that you've got a congregation you know, living within blocks of the church in which they worship and they're working in the same town and going to school in the same town and, and something happens, something catastrophic happens. Somebody needs something. And the Christian church is right there because they're organically living lives together every single day. And that's my point. That we're losing something by the evaporation of the local church, where even myself have to travel 10 miles, which isn't far by car. I mean, I'm happy to drive the 10 miles to First Press. It's, it, to me, I view that as being close. But now, because there are so few solid churches, some of us live in parts of the country or parts of the world where you might have to drive 10, 20, 30, 40 miles, and that's what you have to do. But there is a cost to all of it which is, oh, wow, we're not really connected very much throughout the week. In other words, we have to go out of our way. In the times in which we live right now, we have to go out of our way to be knitted together. So in the Christian community at Tribeca, they don't have to go out of their way at all. <laughs> 
And that's what I want you to see. That's the spiritual truth I would like us to get out of it. Because we live in a toxic, hostile, violent, deceptive world or culture. You know, there's a song, I think it's by James Taylor. You know, he says, you know, that, that this, this world, you know, they'll steal your soul if you let them. But don't you let them, he says. And that's exactly what this world will do. And that's why we need to be a part of a strong Christian community that is knitted together so that we can help one another. Help one another with our feelings. Help one another spiritually. Yes. And so, no, I don't think there's anything in light of what the culture was like. And yes, I, I didn't like to see the rupture between Hal Harris and Daniel Rowland, but they would indeed reconcile and there would be a great revival that is coming and God would use them again. But I appreciate what Hal Harris accomplished within, the, within Tribeca and how even after his death, the family would continue. And many times, Hal Harris had to travel. He would become a soldier in a great war between Britain and France. And, and the family, you know, continued on without him. Because he had aides who would also exhort and young men that would, that would do the preaching and the teaching. So you may say, well, ah, you know what, that sounds very, like, disciplined. You know, too disciplined. Well... What is Hal Harris doing? Well, think about 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Let's look at it this way. All scriptures is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training and righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate or complete, competent, could be another word, equipped for every good work. So here's my simple point. What Hal Harris knows is that truth is outside of him in Jesus Christ. So I look to God for truth. Why? Well, because I trust him. God is holy. He's good. He tells me the truth. He tells me the truth about him. He tells me the truth about me. He tells me the truth about this world. He tells me the truth about life after this grave. God tells me the truth about everything. And he's given me 650,000 words of truth. And my feelings are inside of me. So what I want is I want to bring all aspects of my life, including my feelings, under the authority of Scripture. That's what he's doing personally. That's what he's doing within this Christian community. That's what he's doing by enlarging and encouraging others to do exactly the same. I want to bring all aspects of my life, not, not legalistically, but by the Spirit, I want to bring all aspects of my life under the authority of Scripture. Because the authority of Scripture is God breathed. Thus says the Lord. And it is He who I trust. It is the same thinking of the Puritans. The Puritans are lovely people. So before the Methodists were the Puritans, and they wanted to purify the Church of England from its false teaching, from its spiritual malpractice, if you will, as I, as I like to call it. And they too wanted to bring all aspects of the life under the scriptures. Now again, I think you have to go at this in the right way. In other words, it's not performance-based. It's, it's our appetite has changed. I, I want to live this godly, righteous life. And when you pursue godliness, guess what happens? You indeed will be persecuted. You will be lied about. You'll be called a fanatic, you know, for all things. So, yeah, I am trying to, I'm not trying to put a spin on it. Mm -mm. I'm not trying to say that there was never any issues at Tribeca. But, you know, based on what I've researched so far, they knew how to deal with sin. They weren't hiding it. They had to work together. In other words, like by being knitted together, and when we sin against one another as Christians, that is an opportunity to show mercy and grace. See, it's really easy not being knitted together. <laughs> right? It's really easy. Let me see you once a week, maybe twice a week, and in a very organized setting. Right? Let's be connected through uh, social media. Right? Where we're close, but we're not really close. But if we work together every day, 
then guess what? We're probably going to sin against one another. And that gives us an opportunity to show love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. How else will we grow in Christ? You see my point? So no, I don't think there was anything unusual what Hal Harris was longing for, what he was endeavoring for. And that is something that we should take. That, oh, we truth is outside of us in Christ. Truth says, Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and life. All right? Another way of understanding that, Jesus could be saying, I am the way because I'm truth and life. So truth is outside of us, meaning found in God, and our feelings are subject to God's truth. This toxic culture that we live in today, just as in Hal Harris's day, is saying, no, no, no. Your feelings are important. You listen to yourself. And then you should require those on the outside to affirm your feelings. Well, what's the problem with that? It sounds really nice. The problem is the Bible teaches us the heart is wickedly deceitful because of our fallen nature. We can say many things about ourselves, but you got to stop and ask yourself, is that really true? Are you really certain about that? Hmm? I mean, because we are walking contradictions without God's help. We can have a whole variety of feelings. So the culture saying, trust your feelings, your feelings define you. Your feelings are indeed truth. It's your truth. And everyone needs to affirm your truth. The Christian worldview is saying, no, no, no. We look outside of ourselves onto God for truth. It is he who we trust. And our feelings are under the authority of the scriptures. Because we understand that while we are saved and born from above, sin and our relationship to sin has changed. We are still weak, fallen creatures in the hands of a mighty God. So do you see the difference? So, again, I commend what Hal Harris was doing. I think it was beautiful. Those who would visit had nothing but compliments say what a sweet society it was and just what a godly society and many would come to preach they would be preaching um uh, you know how we have preaching conferences today well that would happen at Tribeca and, and imagine Charles Wesley coming and John Wesley and Daniel Rowland and William Williams and you see this wonderful engraving of George Whitfield this is Whitfield preaching outside on his return from America to London. And you can, I love it just the way he's, he's standing there with his arms raised, holding the Bible, proclaiming the gospel. And then you can see the different listeners as he's preaching outside. And Whitfield would come and preach in Tribeca. And as you look at these different listeners, you can see some that are skeptical, some that may want to bring him harm, others who are deep in thought, other deep in conviction and others who are just hanging on to every word, they are hungry for what God has to say. Yes, indeed. And again, I, I share that with you because Hal Harris will be preaching to a mob at the end of this message. Well, Hal Harris, again, said at the age of 38, he was dying. The Lord was bringing him home soon. And I just want to talk about this for a second. When you serve the Lord... You will be persecuted one way or the other. And even though you know the truth, that you look unto God, our feelings are very powerful. Very powerful. So it's possible, and I'm doing some speculating, but I think it's fair to say based on what Harris was saying, that there was some sense of spiritual depression. Maybe feeling rejected, never becoming an Anglican minister. Um, maybe feeling... Um, uh, not accepted as much as he wanted to be, like he felt perhaps being used in the Methodist movement versus being loved. There could be a whole range of emotions. Okay, I don't want to speculate too much, but I don't think I'm too far off. And so there's spiritual depression. Dr. Martin Lowe Jones one morning woke up and he was getting dressed, had no thought on this matter. And then all of a sudden, the Lord had given him an outline of sermons to preach on the subject of Christian spiritual depression. These sermons, you could, well, you can buy a book, but these sermons, you can hear them 
on the Martin Lloyd-Jones Trust website has over 1,600 sermons, and this is a collection of those sermons. And if you find yourself, because like, whether you're a Sunday school teacher or just just simply a Christian or, or a preacher or a pastor, and like you're like, man, I'm just, I'm downcast. I'm downcast. Then I give that to you as a prescription to help your soul. Listen to it. Listen to what the doctor has to say. And, and he will help you. And I also want to encourage you to seek help. Yes. Especially, and now I'm going off topic, okay? Going off topic here. But I want to have to address this issue of suicide. Um, though my words, I'm sure, are going to be very feeble. And I, and I raise it up because I keep hearing stats that suicide rates are increasing, especially since COVID, especially among men, among men. And I have heard men speak in having suicidal thoughts. And what I want to share to you in God's providence, if you have those thoughts, is this simple principle. A, you live in a world that is very hostile. It's not your imagination. It's toxic. It's corrosive. It wants to mislead you. It wants to deceive you. It wants to get you to believe things that are untrue. Even to the point of leading to your own destruction. You are to trust in God and fight against these evil forces. That you are to hold on to God and trust in Him in all things in your life. And the fact that you need help, you have nothing to be ashamed of. For help actually shows strength. You will see throughout all of the Christian scriptures how Christians are helping one another. And help shows strength, by getting help shows strength, because it shows that you are not giving up. So my feeble words to you, not knowing your situation or anything of that nature, is to seek help. For seeking help shows great strength because you're not giving up. And the dark forces that are perhaps the fiery darts of the devil, if you will, are real. So seek help from your Christian minister, from a Christian friend, from your spouse, from your parents. Depending on the age of your children, perhaps your children. And there are Christian doctors, Christian psychiatrists, who can help you as well. I, I, th I guess what my point is, there is no shame in asking for help. You know, this culture wants us to create a narrative, an image about ourselves, to have us wear a mask of some sort. Let us not have this culture get the best of us by thinking somehow we have to fake it until we can make it. No, you, you seek help today. Because by seeking help, you're saying, I refuse to give up. And I hope that is of some help, some encouragement to you. So the Lord's not done with you. The Lord's not done with Hal Harris at the age of 38. No, Hal Harris, there'd be a great battle that would break out, a war between Britain and France, and Harris would see it spiritually There'd be five young men who would join him in joining the military services to defend his country because if the, um, if the Pope was to be successful, the, um, well, then that would eradicate the Protestant faith in England. And so he saw it as an, a direct assault, you know, Roman Catholicism against Protestant, Protestantism, and it was an, a direct assault against the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So he took up arms along with five younger men, and they fought bravely. Um, and Hal Harris used it as an opportunity <laughs> to proclaim the gospel message. So even during the battles and wars, Hal Harris, what is he doing? He's preaching the gospel because he's not going to stop regardless of the persecution. So he goes, there's a place, and I can't know if I pronounce it right, it's called Yarmouth, 
Y-A-R-M-O-U-T-H. Okay? And you know what? This place, they bitterly opposed Methodist preachers. Okay? So Hal Harris goes to the town crier and says, tell the people there's going to be a, a sermon today. And so they set up a table for him, and the townspeople come, and this is what's recorded. At the time appointed, a large mob collected together, furnished with stones, brick bats, bludgeons, blood, and filthy materials suited to their work, vowing if the preacher came, he should never go out of the town alive. All right, sounds really familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> God bless Al Harris. God bless. And now this is the winsome, cute part, if you will. At least I find it this way. So this is Mr. Harris sees all this because it, re, it's, it records here. Mr. Harris, who had been ex exercising his men a little distance, went, that meaning his soldiers, when the clock struck, went to the multitude and inquired what was the matter. What's the matter, folks? What's happening here? And they replied that a Methodist preacher was to have come. Mr. Harris told him that he thought it was a pity that they should be wholly disappointed, and that if they would favor him with their attention, he would sing a hymn and pray with them, and also give them a little friendly advice. <laughs> it's a little bit like Apostle Paul, right? Hey, I see you got a lot of gods here. You even got the, the unknown god, in case you overlook anybody. Can I give you some friendly advice? Oh, that's really sweet. He then mounted the table. I mean, he got on top of the table and and had been prepared for him. His men who surrounded him with their arms, joining him most devoutly in singing and pray and prayer. Mr. Harris preached with little interruption. Their hearts of many of the hearers were softened and prejudices vanished. Some were awakened to the serious concerns for their souls and led to inquire how they might be saved. Hal Harris, and very, again, the culture is toxic, is prejudiced against the Lord. And this is why we need to pray for revival. Remember, prejudices vanish. That's what it says here. Mr. Harris preached with little interruption. The hearts of many of their hearts were softened and prejudice vanished. That's why we pray for revival. For God rend the heavens, come down, his Holy Spirit is poured out, and it breaks the iron chest of men, women, and children so the gospel message could be applied to their hearts and they would come to saving faith. And that's why we pray for revival. Well, this is how we're going to leave this week's message. Charles Wesley wrote a wonderful a poem to Hal Harris just about their need of him to continue on within the Methodist cause and not take himself off the battlefield. And at the end of the poem, it says this, Then let our Savior God have all the praise and humbly call to mind the former days, when he who waked thy soul to second birth sent forth a newborn child to shake the earth, to tear the prey out of the lion's teeth, and spoil the trembling realms of hell and death, by violent faith to seize the kingdom given, and open burst the gates of vanquished heaven. Hmm, amen. So, Charles Wesley's talking about Hal Harris here. When he who waked thy soul to second birth, that's Harris being born from above, set forth a newborn child to shake the earth. Well, that newborn child is indeed Hal Harris. And how did he shake the earth? To tear the prey out of the lion's teeth, right? And spoil the trembling realms of hell and death, meaning the schemes of the devil through the preaching of Hal Harris were being defeated. And I love this, by violent faith, not just faith, but by violent faith to seize the kingdom given, that's him being an enthusiast, as we should be as well, and open burst the gates of vanquished heaven. Hmm. Well, brothers and sisters in the faith, let that be an encouragement to us. Regardless of where we're at, yes, we are weak, we are frail, we are misguided people at times. We need to show each other grace, forgiveness, mercy. We need to be able to accept it, by the way. And we need to continue on. That none of us have it all figured out. That we are simply um, uh, sinners who were seeking life from Christ. And we are in his wonderful hands. We serve a great God. And so let us always keep that in mind that God uses weak vessels to advance his cause. Weak vessels. That's what the scriptures show. That's what church history demonstrates. 
And so, yes, while you and I are just frail human beings, but we are born again from God and we are called to advance his kingdom. And let's continue to do so in using our own personalities, but in a very winsome, firm, and biblical way. Well, I hope this week's message was an encouragement to you and a blessing. Until next time, grace upon grace be with you all.